Let x0 be the root of the function y equals f of x. If the first derivative of the function at x0 is not 0, then we say that we have a simple root at x0. You can see that the tangent to the curve at x0 is not a horizontal line. Now in this situation here we have what's called a double root. This is the graph of y equals x minus 1 squared. Um, when x is 1 you can see that y is 0. Now if we look at the first derivative at that root we have a horizontal line. So the first derivative is 0. So we can easily verify that. If we work out the first derivative at x equals 1, we'll have a 1 in here, so we'll end up with 0 for the first derivative. And uh, what about the second derivative? Well, the second derivative, if we differentiate 2x minus 1, or 2x minus 2 with respect to x, we get 2. So the second derivative is not 0. Here's an example of a function that has a triple root. We can clearly see that at x equals 2, y is 0. What about dy dx? Well, we apply the chain rule. And we see that dy dx at x equals 2 is going to give us 0. What about the second derivative? Um, well, if we use the chain rule again, we're going to get 6x minus 2 to the power of 1 times the derivative of x. Well, that's just 1. We can see that at x equals 2, that this is also 0. So, both first and second derivatives are 0 at x equals 2 for this function here. Let's look at some more examples. Let's take this function here, x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4. Now the negative root is here, and uh, we can see that it's a simple root. The first derivative is not 0 because the tangent here is not horizontal. At x equals 2, we have a double root. The first derivative is 0, the tangent is horizontal. Here's another example of a function whose roots are double roots. This function is got by taking sine of x and shifting it by one unit up. So normally the range of the sine, well the range of the sine function is from minus 1 to plus 1, so if we add 1 on to that we see the range of this function 1 plus sine of x is from 0 to 1, or 0 to 2 I should say. Let's take the function f of x equals x minus 2 plus ln of x. Now this function has a root between x equals 1 and x equals 2. If we calculate f of 1, we actually get minus 1, which is negative. So the function is negative at 1, so the graph is below the x-axis at x equals 1. But at f equals 2, the function is actually positive, so the graph is above the x-axis at x equals 2. So that means that the graph must cross the x-axis somewhere between 1 and 2. So there's a root between 1 and 2, so we just if we see a sign change for a function, this function changes from negative to positive or positive to negative over an interval, then the graph must cross that interval at least once. Now of course we can keep on dividing down this interval. We could divide this interval in, into two intervals. Um, so we could examine the function at 1.5, the midpoint of this interval, see if it's positive or negative. If you work out f of 1.5 you'll get a negative value whereas f of 2 is positive, so that means there must be a root between 1.5 and 2 because the function changes sign. Um, we could further divide the interval, so we could divide the interval from 1.5 to 2, so the midpoint of that interval is 1.75. We could examine the function at 1.75, we'll see that it's positive. Since the function changes from negative to positive over the interval from 1.5 to 1.75, it means that there must be a root between 1.5 and 1.75. So we can keep repeating this procedure, of course, and uh, we'll get a smaller and smaller interval in which the root must lie. Now a much better improvement on that method is the Newton-Raphson method. Now, the premise of the Newton-Raphson method is that the curve in the neighbourhood of x star so x star is the root, 
can be approximated by a straight line. So we're assuming here that we have a simple root at x star. So the tangent to the curve at this root x star is not horizontal. The reason why we want this curve to be approximated by a straight line near x star is that if we draw the tangent to the curve at x naught, then the tangent will hit the x-axis at a point that's closer to x star than what x naught is. So if x naught is our first approximation to the root, then this point here, p, which we will call x1, is a better approximation. x1 is closer to x star. You can see that if the curve from x star to this point here was exactly a straight line, then, of course, the tangent would be just the same as the curve. Tangent and the curve would coincide. And x1 would equal x star. That would be the ideal situation, of course, if this was a perfect straight line. We can see from this picture that x1 is equal to x0 minus the distance of p to q. Or if we add pq onto x1, we get x0, of course. Um, we can also see that tan of theta, that's the angle that the tangent makes with the positive x-axis, is rq over pq. And that's just the derivative of the function at x0. So the slope of this tangent line is the derivative of the function. And the slope of any line is the tan of the angle that the line makes with the positive x-axis. The angle measured anti-clockwise from the positive x-axis. But we know that rq is just the value of the function at x0. It's just the y value of this point. So now we see that x1 is x0 minus f of x0 divided by f prime of x0. So in general, x1 will be closer to x star than x0 is, provided that this section of the curve is approximately a straight line. So we can imagine repeating this procedure. We can then start with x1 as our new uh, approximation to the root, to x star. And we can imagine um, constructing a tangent to the curve at x1 and seeing where that tangent hits the x-axis. And that, ta that point will be even closer to x star than the point p is. So what I mean is the following. Like what we did here, we projected from x0 up to the curve. That was our first approximation. Now x1 is our next approximation. Project to the curve, construct a tangent like we did at x0. And we can calculate this point in exactly the same way as what we did here. So let's call the point where the tangent cuts this x-axis x2. And let's call this horizontal distance here h. So the tangent makes angle theta 2 with the positive x-axis. The tan of theta 2 is opposite over adjacent. So this is also theta 2 in here, of course. These are opposite angles. Uh, so this side here is just the value of the function at x1, or f of x1, and we divide by the adjacent, which is h. Of course, we know that the tan of theta 2, the slope of the tangent to the curve at x1, is just the derivative of the function at x1. So rearranging we get this here. Now we just have to be careful here. I'm assuming here that h is a positive quantity. So if we add h onto x1 we get x2. And x2 we can see from the picture is greater than x1. Um, so the tan of theta 2 is f of x1 divided by h. But we see that f of x1 is negative. So the uh, function is negative at x1. So we have to put a minus sign here because the tan of theta 2 has to come out to be positive. Theta 2 is an acute angle, as you can see from this picture. So actually h is given by this here. So we have to stick a minus sign in here. Actually, we, we don't want a minus sign here um, because the derivative is positive, as you can see. The slope of this line is positive. Um, so here is h. F of x, it's f of x1 that's negative. So anyway, there's h, so we have to add that onto x1, so that's how we get our x2. So you can see our formula for x2 has the same form as our formula for x1. So we just change the subscripts. So we change the 0 to a 1, 
and this one becomes a two and you can imagine iterating this process now using this point going to the curve getting another tangent and so on so then we would have a better approximation by plugging x2 in here and then we get out x3 and so on now with x3 found out we can plug 3 in here plug x3 in here and then we get out x4 an even better approximation to the root